UFTV is your university and community TV station. Welcome to Conversations with Visiting Poets. Today we have Andres Carlson Wee, poet, NEA fellow, uh, recently published his first collection of poems, The Low Passions, also author of several chapbooks, among them Dynamite, winner of the third annual Frost Place chapbook comp competition. Uh, he's going to start us off with a poem, and then we will have a conversation. So I'll leave it to you, cool. Andres. Yeah, thank you. So this poem is called Dynamite. My brother hits me hard with a stick, so I whip a choke chain across his face. We're playing a game called dynamite, where everything you throw is a stick of dynamite, unless it's pine. Pine sticks are rifles, and pine cones are grenades. But everything else is dynamite. I run down the driveway and back behind the garage, where we keep the leopard frogs in buckets of water with logs and rock islands. When he comes around the corner, the blood is pouring out of his nose and down his neck, and he has a hammer in his hand. I pick up his favorite frog and say, if you come any closer, I'll squeeze. He tells me I won't. He starts coming closer. I say a hammer isn't dynamite. He reminds me that everything is dynamite. What a great poem to open with. Um, <clears throat> for many reasons, but uh, chief among them, for those who know your work and those who yeah. will know it soon, um, they will come to know that your brother and other members of your family tend to recur in your poetry. Yeah. And I'm curious, um, I've read some other poets, mostly European, who have kind of taken a dim view of writing about family. Yeah. Uh, which I disagree with, but I'm curious about your take on that. What do you get out of writing from about family? What are you looking for when you do that? Yeah, well, I think for me it's um, a question mostly just about like what your obsessions are and what mm. you, know, you, you, you can't stop thinking about. And I think for me, um, when I first started writing, family was like an immediate, I think the first poem I ever drafted was about me and my brother. And, um, uh, it's, I think writers follow their obsessions, maybe poets in a certain way even in particular. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, family has been uh, my most central relationships. Mm -hmm. And I'm a very relationship driven as a, as a person, uh, especially one-on-one -on -one relationships. And so I tend to write about them. Uh, it's sort of just like, it's how my imagination works. Um, and I think, you know, maybe there's something to, you know, the American, family or something. I don't, I don't know if there's an element to the, uh, the isolation in America hmm. uh, where there's sort of an absence of, in a lot of context, I mean, this isn't everybody, but in a lot of context, absence of a larger community, mm -hmm. uh, absence of kind of like neighborly uh, relationships and uh, the kind of like a huge emphasis in this country on the nuclear family um, might be part of that, might be part of that interest in, for Americans sure. uh, yeah. to write about it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it also seems like the place where we really learn how to be kind of a part of a community, right? Yeah. It's this place where we test out different ways of existing, relating, having these dynamics that do and do not succeed. Or, right. Um, another thing about your family, I think, in particular, is y'all have a lot of really interesting stories and provenances. Mm -hmm. um, like, for instance, both your parents are pastors, you yeah. said. What kind of influences that had upon you, particularly in your poetry, would you say? Yeah, well, so growing up as a pastor's kid, um, my mom was a pastor in Fargo, my dad was a pastor in Moorhead, and those are two towns on opposite sides of a river, so I was basically mm -hmm. shuffling back and forth between two churches my whole childhood, and I was doing my best to ignore everything that was happening. Basically, you know, I, I didn't want to be there, and it felt mm -hmm. like I had to participate in my parents' work in a weird way, and my, yeah. my friends were members of the churches, and that was embarrassing to me. Uh, because their parents mostly did other types of work, and, and I felt, you know, kind of estranged in a way because my parents were sort of uh, uh, public, so public, sure. uh, and yeah. in a spiritual realm, which is an even weirder form of public. Right, because um, it's also private, but public at the same time. Yeah, it's... yeah, exactly. Uh, and so I tried my best to ignore my parents, I think, when growing up, but it was one of those things where, like, how can you, you know, I'm sitting there, I would be, like, doodling on the bulletins, basically, but I'm hearing my parents uh, preach over and over again mm -hmm. 
uh, year after year. And also my grandfathers, also my aunts and uncles, all pastors. And so I grew up listening to a lot of sermons. Um, and my parents in particular preach with a personal narrative style where they're often taking a biblical text and then sort of marrying that to some kind of event from their own lives mm. or an event from a friend's life or, or from their kids' lives. So I was in a lot of the sermons uh, as that a character. That must have been mortifying yeah, for you yeah, as a child. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, yeah, it was really embarrassing, especially because <laughs> my friends are there or whatever. But, um, and my parents would think it was so cute and that made it worse, you know, <laughs> uh, right? Yeah. Uh, but, so I grew up, l without wanting to learn about it, I, was I think I was really learning about how to uh, combine things that are not inherently uh, hmm. similar. Uh, how to take a biblical text that has like a kind of holy stature uh, or might have a theme, like a kind of abstract theme about how to live or something like that, and how to like weave that with something from your own life, uh, something domestic or personal yeah. or more uh, grounded, more earthy, uh, and sort of how to make those two things illuminate one another. Uh, and I think that's, that has influenced a lot of my writing. Yeah. specifically that that sort of com combination of things. It seems like a great education in kind of the operation of metaphor yeah. uh, and simile. Yeah, exactly. And also the, the body of language, right? I grew up in the language of the church, uh, specifically the Lutheran church. And so the, the liturgical style of worship, um, use of repetition, hmm. uh, use of, of language to be kind of like language as sort of like m more powerful than the individual is kind of a, an emphasis. Uh, and I think I just, I, both the vocabulary and also kind of a reverence for language was something I developed. Uh, once again, without sort of <laughs> intending to in a way. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love the idea of like the language is more powerful than the individual. This kind of organism that we're all kind of subsumed into. Yeah, uh, right. I'm curious, so um, you've led a kind of series of lives before you kind of came to being a poet. Uh, did, was there, I mean, obviously there's poetry in the tradition of like the King James Bible yeah. uh, and throughout, but was there, what led you to poetry? Because you started off, you know, a pastor's kid, you're yeah. also a professional rollerblader, survivalist right. as well. How did you end up uh, finding poetry and when did you realize that like this was the thing? Yeah. Because you had other options. I yeah, well, I mean, yeah, in some ways. I, yeah, I grew up as a skater, a rollerblader, yeah. and did that professionally in high school and um, was really obsessed with that, very deep into yeah. that culture and uh, later studied wilderness survival for some years and uh, urban survival, dumpster diving, stuff like that, that all kind of uh, was part of my, my sort of youth. Um, but when I came to poetry, uh, first with, a, with kind of a sincerity, was in a college class hmm. uh, taught by Mary Cornish, who's a fantastic poet herself. And um, she really opened up some door in my brain very quickly in, that I just, in a way that I, 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 something poetry could do that I hadn't, hadn't sort of seen or felt. It hadn't felt for myself. Yeah. And she drew me into it. But I think what really taught me how to write poetry was primarily the skating background. Hmm. Uh, and I can try to talk about that, yeah, if Please you Please do, yeah. So uh, basically in skating, um, uh, skate tricks are designed to be uh, f filmable. They're designed to have a, a, you know, uh, a visual quality. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically every skate trick has some kind of contract with the viewer. Um, so a skate trick, you know, will will start in a certain way based on how the skater is approaching the object, and uh, the obstacle, and sort of what they're doing on the way toward it. Mm -hmm. And then almost all skate tricks are divided into two categories. One type of trick basically fulfills the contract in a beautiful manner. So there's a, there's like if you're a skater that does that a lot, you're emphasizing grace and you're emphasizing the idea of following through on sure. like the initial plan. Uh, those skaters tend to be smoother. Um, and then the other type of trick is basically you're, you're wanting to subvert the contract that you started. Uh, and those types of tricks in, are more based on the element of surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's also the issue of if you're always doing a surprise, it becomes a gimmick. And so the best skaters tend to do sort of a half and half approach basically, where yeah. uh, half, your, <clears throat> half, your, half your tricks are going to subvert expectations and half, the, half your tricks are gonna follow through on expectations. And it, it is like creates that feeling of like you, you, you precariousness where you can't quite guess what's going to happen next. And I think poems are built in actually a similar way. Um, when you start a poem, when you start reading a poem as a reader, there's some kind of initial contract. And uh, I think a lot of poems are to, you know, it's, a, it's overly simplistic, but basically you're either following through in some way on your contract 
or you're subverting it or kind of, you know, using the expectation you've set up as a way to pivot. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that those types of strategies were uh, something that came really second nature to me by that point because I'd skated for so long. And uh, we would read poems and I could, I could sort of see their structures yeah. uh, in a kind of tactile way, I think. Uh, That's incredible. Um, I mean, were you, and this is very autobiographical, so forgive me, but I'm yeah. interested because, I mean, at the time that you were studying poetry in this more sincere and more engaged way, were you still yeah. skating or was this just knowledge that you had kind of fully uh, ingested so yeah. that it just, it was a reflex that when you yeah. encountered artistry, that's what you saw? Both. I, yeah. I was still skating, but not as seriously, but I'd started skating at 10 years old and mm. skated every single day until I was 19. Wow. So it was nine years of every single day. And so that was my... You know, that was my education. Yeah. That was my everything to me. You know, mm -hmm. so for me growing up, like school was just like in the way of skating and church was in the way of skating. Sure. And so I used all of my energy and like all my thought was towards skating and also watching skating, right? Because sure. ultimately skating is to, be, is to be recorded and filmed. That's kind of what most skaters are doing. Mm -hmm. And so as a skater, you're also really invested in watching skating and figuring out what makes something look beautiful. Sure. Uh, so it's similar to dance in a lot of ways in that, in that way. It's, ultimately, there's an audience uh, and you're trying to present, present a mood and a texture, not necessarily a narrative, but uh, hmm. an aesthetic quality. Yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, I can see a lot of, aside from the, the aesthetic value, the aesthetic education that you're talking about, yeah. some other kinds of modalities in the skating life that you're describing yeah. mapping nicely onto like the poet's life. I, I imagine yeah. you steep yourself as much in poetry or have been in the same kind of way. Yeah, I think I, skating taught me how to be sort of self-directed yeah. and how to train uh, hard to, to like aim toward goals further away. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, with writing, I think in the education system, writing is often uh, taught more like, you know, just go home and write something and then we'll look at it sort of as if it's already, you know, sort of like a product. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, visual arts seem to be taught more like skating is taught where you all practice on something. You know, we might all draw this, this yeah. plant and then we'd all look at it together and talk about uh, our choices that we made, but we wouldn't be looking at it as like, this is the piece of art that's gonna be like in the, in the museum, right? Like we're looking at it just as a practice technique. And I think writing often, writers kind of don't necessarily learn how to do that mm -hmm. um, because it's not really taught. There's not like a workshop setting where you just sort of practice live with each other. Right, yeah. Uh, and I think skating helped me um, trust more, basically trust, to, trust myself to like fail over and over again in attempts, mm. uh, but like use them as, as, as jumping off points for moving forward. Yeah, yeah, failure not as something that is inherently problematic or bad, yeah. but failure as an important step in the process, getting yeah. towards success, whatever that yeah, may look yeah, like. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, because I mean, I, I see that a lot in the, you know, the writing classroom, this, this aversion to failure. Yeah. Uh, for what it, a variety of different reasons that they exist. But right, and I think for young writers, there's the feeling of like, what do you mean revision? You know, this is how I wrote it. It's, right, This yeah. is my truth sort Absolutely. of attitude. And uh, you've got you to gotta get a little past that if you're going to write something <laughs> good, you know. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Um, would you want to talk a little bit about your writing practice? I mean, I know that it's been yeah. a while since this book has been out. It's a great book. Uh, excited yeah. to hear you read from it this evening. Yeah. Um, but how do you yeah. write a poem uh, at this point? Yeah. Um, as somebody uh, intimate with your own practice, do you yeah, find... Yeah, well, I'm sort of a workhorse. Yeah. Um, I, I think some writers uh, are, are more of a mind, like they wait for like the muse to sort of speak sure. to them. Yeah. And when they feel invigorated to write, then they, then they go to the paper. I'm more uh, of, a, of a daily grinder mm -hmm. of a writer and also I think of the writing as the space that gets me to like a place of passion mm -hmm. rather than uh, having it beforehand and then starting to write. So I like, I go to writing for that feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for me, I write just essentially every day and I draft a lot of poems that are not good. Sure. Uh, yeah. And I throw them away, basically. I kind of set them aside and sometimes you uh, call them together for something mm -hmm. else. But um, yeah. I just draft a lot, of, a lot of pieces. And I think my, my imagination is um, fairly driven by narrative. And so a lot of my pieces start from a place of narrative. But they don't really like get going unless uh, uh, I have that narrative sort of like in my brain sort of like wed to a musical approach. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's like a little hard to explain maybe, 
but I basically, most of the time, I, I need to be able to kind of hear, hear a little bit of what the poem's rhythm might be based on how it's, you know, it's like it needs to kind of make sense with the narrative. Yeah. Uh, those two elements usually need to be in place for me to get going. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, I'm very narratively driven. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I really like that for myself as a writer because when you're starting with narrative, uh, some kind of narrative premise, um, it, it kind of gives you a, a string to like pull along through the dark. Mm -hmm. um, sort of like just like the unfolding of events, but uh, you know, there's that sense of like, where am I even going with this, or or why would this be worth reading? You know, why would this? Why are we talking about this? And mm -hmm. that's like, I like the, the uh, how many unknowns you you can have in that setting, and then part of the writing process is that discovery, uh, and hopefully that's felt in the text. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I remember reading uh, an interview recently with Stephen Dunn. He's talking about how it's not until he's arrived at a surprise that he has created for himself yeah. that the writing really seems to take off. Yeah, and yeah. It seems kind of similar to what you're saying yeah, as well. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I think if you, you, in my attempts to ever know where I'm going, uh, they, those poems tend to fail. They tend to fall apart. Yeah. Um, or if they fail on the first draft, I actually realize I'm trying to talk about something that I didn't even know I was trying to talk about. Right. And they end up changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's good to share too with younger writers who might be watching this that failure is okay. Jettisoning yeah. a draft is okay. Oh, it's or... almost all failures. <laughs> no, it's, no, yeah. yeah, no, it's almost all failures. Like this book has 53 poems. I drafted. I approached maybe, maybe as many as 1,500 drafts of, of poems. 1,500. Yeah, yeah. It took wow. me 10 years to write. Yeah. Um, so essentially, all failures. Sure. This is like. The, the the failures that were the most <laughs> presentable, you know what I mean? Like yeah, it's, yeah absolutely. It's You're failing better this time. Yeah, exactly. I think that's yeah. I think that's true. Um, and if you're, you know, I think there's that weird balance of like I think there's a lot of perfectionism in a lot of writers, uh, mm -hmm. but you, sure. but you got to find ways to not let that kind of paralyze your process. I think uh, and keep going and keep writing the next thing. Yeah. Because uh, perfection isn't interesting anyway. I mean, it's just it's like that's not what's going to make something compelling. Mm -hmm. uh, or provocative, uh, it's it's somehow the energy behind it and the the push, and it's like yeah, those are hard, those are elusive things. But uh, sure, absolutely. It, yeah. Do you have techniques for subduing that perfectionist side in your head? Because I know that I've been trying, I'm always trying to cultivate different ones to trick my own self yeah. out. Because it's it's an evolving creature that lives inside of us that's trying to take control. Totally, I know what you mean. Yeah, it's um, one is just the the, the daily drafting. Yeah. Just keep going, keep drafting something new. Um, if I'm drafting more, I'm, I'm most, you know, most of them are bad, but then I kind of, I'm letting go of the fact that they're bad mm. because it's like, okay, they're, they're just going to be bad. I kind of accept it more. Yeah. And then on a day where something goes better, it's just like a joy and an excitement and oh, cool. I think this one has some power. Maybe, you know, I could, I want to shape this one. Yeah. Uh, and I think if I wasn't drafting as much, each failure would feel more like a failure of like my perfection aside mm -hmm. would be like, this isn't working. Oh no. Like. You know, and so part of it is like uh, tricking my brain by just writing a lot. Yeah. Uh, I think another side is, uh, for me, is um, kind of kind of like falling in love with content, falling in love with characters, mm -hmm. and falling in love with uh, craft, falling in love with like the music of the poem or the form that you're trying to structure. And if those elements are something you love in your brain, you're kind of in love with them, then you want them to to kind of have a life, and and you want to go forward with the piece to see what see how it unfolds and. It's like you get outside yourself, basically. Yourself, yeah. you, you as a person sort of fades in favor of the content and in favor of the craft. Uh, and in favor of your characters, if you like writing about characters, which I do, so. Yeah. yeah. Maybe this is a good way to uh, lead us into a final poem. Sure, um, sure. Uh, I'll read for you Primer, uh, which is kind of hmm. a conversation piece. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, and you might want to know primer is a word uh, that means like a short booklet for children to introduce them to any topic. Mm -hmm. That's called a primer. And what if you have nothing? I pick up a stick. Yes, that's always first. And next? I see what I can see around me. Find the sun or moon. Find high ground. Find north by where the moss grows. Yes, now close your eyes. Find them. The sun's behind. I can feel it on my neck, high grounds to my right, north's ahead. Yes, and the wind? The wind's west, it cools my left temple. Yes, and next. If I can bug out, I bug out. Otherwise, I go high and dig a foxhole and tie something bright above me. 
You're forgetting something. Right. First I cut my name in the dirt. Then I go high. Yes. And next. I walk a loop with my bright thing in sight. If I find a better stick, I switch for it. Yes. And if you need to cry, I crawl inside my foxhole and cry. And what do you tell yourself as you cry? Someone's coming. Yes. And what if no one comes? Each hour I call in all directions. I listen. And what do you listen for? Sounds that shouldn't be there. Yes. Sounds that should be there but aren't. Yes. And what have you heard since we started? A bird. Yes. Another bird far away. Yes. A gust in the trees. Yes. Your voice, if your voice counts. Yes. My voice counts. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, hey. Andres Carlson Wee, first full book, The Low Passions, out from W.W. W. Norton. Great book. Hope you pick it up. Thank you for watching. And thanks again. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah. yeah. UFTV is your university and community TV station.